So a lot of people have been asking for guides to the 2-litre TFSI engine, the EA888 unit as supplied by the Volkswagen Audi Group. It was one that was taken over from the 1.8T engines that we've just covered and we've got videos on those. And the EA888 came as a 1.8 and a 2-litre. The blocks are pretty much identical. It's the components used within the engine and that bolt onto the engine that make a difference. So we're going to look at the common problems that crop up with these engines. There's a few inherent things that owners need to be aware of. There's certainly good engines they make good power and they've been used in a big variety of engines from smaller family cars to high performance cars <laughs> I had the 2-litre TFSI in my A4 Quattro. It was tuned to about 220 horsepower from the factory. So I think that was the Bull engine. It was a good solid unit, but in owning it, I've picked up a few recommendations that I would certainly like to pass on to you in this video. So the biggest common complaint you get with the 2-litre TFSI engine is the high oil consumption. Now, just the whole nature and design of the engine means that this engine is gonna use more oil than you were probably used to in your other cars and other engines. In fact, one litre per thousand miles is not regarded as unusual on this engine. But if you exceed one litre per thousand miles, that's starting to become very excessive. I think my car used about one litre every one and a half thousand miles. So it was certainly one of the cars that I had to keep an eye on the oil level. I've never really had to do that before. But you, you really must make sure that oil level doesn't drop too much or you will start having all sorts of problems. So the cause of the high oil consumption is open to some debate and lots of people have got their own pet theories that they will expound to you as to why this happens from design of the piston rings to the way the engine works. The problem seems to be around the crankshaft seals, which is allowing the oil to escape into areas of the engine where you don't really want it and it's starting to just burn off. So when you retrofit the crankshaft seal and you also fit an oil separator, it pretty much alleviates that problem. If you're still getting excessive oil consumption, then you've got other issues, probably down to wear within the engine or pistons. You may even be noticing blue smoke. So that's not the usual high oil consumption issue on this. That's down to excessive wear and tear on the actual engine itself. Always make sure you use the right grade of oil in these engines as well. With the turbo, it runs very, very hot and you will suffer from sludge buildup if you'd use the wrong grade of oil in your two litre TFSIs. Please drop us a like, it really helps us to get out there and don't forget to stay tuned. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. Don't miss out on all the other content that we're pushing out. I'm trying to release weekly videos and within the week I'm releasing videos based on niche questions that I've got from my viewers and people from our website. So, so there's a few faults that relate to very specific implementations of the EA888 engine. Engine. Pre-2015 engines were prone to turbo failure. That was something particularly evident on the 280 and 300 PS versions. The sort of engine you would typically see on an engine with a CJXB or CJXC engine code. And the problem comes around the shafts in the turbocharger. They tend to break. It doesn't seem to affect engines that were made after 2015 though, thankfully. So it looks like they've resolved that potential problem. Also on the 2007 Golf R and Golf GTI, there's reports of thermostat housings which tend to break and leak. Now they use plastic thermostat housings and you can get metal replacements which are much more durable and much more resilient than the original manufacturer's plastic part. Engines fitted with a plastic sump, obviously the plastic sump is a little more fragile than the alloy sumps than earlier engines that the Volkswagen Audi group used. So so keep an eye on that. It shouldn't really be a problem, but as it ages and gets more brittle and if there's been impacts under the car and the shielding has started to degrade, you may well start to experience minor leaks from the sump. So do keep an eye on that and just check that that's not become a problem. So don't just assume that because your car is a TFSI, it has the EA888 block, because the earlier EA113 was still used in a lot of models and versions up until fairly recent times. So it does get very, very confusing, but the significant changes that were made to the EA888 over and above the EA113. The EA888 used the vacuum operated flaps on the intake, whereas the earlier engine used a motorized system. It also also had a completely redesigned mass airflow sensor and intake area on the engine 
and the coils were also different. The EA888 also used a chain throughout the, the cams and crank, whereas the earlier engine used a belt between the crank and the top of the engine and then used a chain to, to connect the top parts of the engine on the camshafts. So checking a timing chain tensioner fault is actually surprisingly easy. If you've got access to a VAGCOM, that plugs into the diagnostic port and allows you to read off a lot of codes and really see what the engine is actually doing at the time it is running. So with the engine running, if you check, I think it's blocks 208 and 209, it should read minus 8kW to plus 8kW. That's the official area of tolerance on that. Um, if it starts to get worse than that, you've got a tensioner that is on its way out. And if it gets up to about 12 either way, you've got problems. The ECU will tend to fire up an engine warning light and may even fire the limp home mode, um, restricting the power and the way the engine works. So VAGCOM diagnostic tool is very valuable. I'm gonna do a video on how to use it and what it is in a future video. So stay tuned for that. But um, if you've got a VAGCOM, it's just great to have a look and see what's going on inside the engine and determine whether the problem is about to rear its ugly head. And with the timing chain tensioner, you don't really want to experience a failed tensioner. You can catch that problem quite early on. This engine also used a plastic sump, which is a lot lighter, but a lot of people have said it's less durable. It is protected by a shield under the engine bay itself, but it is a potential weak spot that you need to know about. So another common problem is pressure loss from the turbo so a loss of boost you might get flat spots just poor running um, it might top out and hit a certain power level and then just not make any more power and you'll notice that as a sort of brick wall of power as you're driving so what causes this well typically it's the n75 or the n249 the n75 valve is one we've discussed we've got other videos covering the n75 valve um, but in short the n75 valve is what pushes the actuator on the wastegate of the turbo turbo, allowing the turbo to receive the exhaust gases and spool up. So the ECU will control the N75 valve. When it receives a pulse of electric, it diverts the pressurized air to a little wastegate actuator where there's a diaphragm inside and that diaphragm will push down, pushing the wastegate actuator rod against the turbo, physically opening that channel so the exhaust gases can flow through the turbo. So the N75 valve will start to wear, it will start to stick and start to hesitate. So rather than fiddle with it, just replace it. It's a very simple replacement job. It's literally three pipes and an electrical connector. So anyone can do that, even with very limited DIY experience. Um, some people recommend you fiddle with the N75 valve and make tiny adjustments to it. I don't really recommend that. The ECU is controlling the rates and the amount of boost that you're getting. So you won't really gain much in the long term as the ECU learns that it's opening more suddenly and it will just back off a little bit. It. So any gains you perceive by adjusting it are going to be lost in the long term. The N249 valve is a little more interesting. So people often replace these with a blow off valve. So it will take the excessive pressure within the turbo when you've lifted off the throttle and it dumps that back in the turbo's inlet. So it helps to keep the air spooling around the turbo. It keeps the turbo spinning up. The air pressure's in there ready for you to go. So as the revs have dropped and the turbo would typically produce less power, as soon as you go back on throttle, there is some pressurized air there, so you'll lift off more quickly. But the engines do not like blow off valves. They don't like losing that amount of pressure from the intake. They get confused. They go into limp home mode and they do complain. So avoid atmospheric dump valves on these. If the N249 is sticking or not operating correctly, replace it. There are performance alternatives around that operate more smoothly, offer a greater ranges, can cope with bigger pressure differences and generally last a lot longer than the standard factory ones. So I would certainly seek out those replacements if you've got a problem. But if there's no problem there, I certainly didn't have one with mine. I don't think it's even worth spending the money in the first place. So the Volkswagen Audi Group went direct injection on the TFSI engines on the EA888 block. So the 1.8 and the 2 litres, it was an all new thing. They used direct injection so they could run much higher pressures within the engine. They wouldn't suffer from premature ignition like you would with the conventional port injection. But the downside was there's now no longer fuel going onto the valves that go into the engine. 
And as we've already mentioned, there's all sorts of oil flowing around the exhaust and the crankcase. So as this is dumped into the intake, because it's not environmentally friendly to dump that out to the atmosphere, you start to get a buildup of oily deposits on the intakes and that builds up into carbon. So on the bigger engines, the 4 litres, the V6s, the V8s, it's a very big problem. It tends to be less of a problem on the smaller engines, which is interesting. So the 2 litre TFSI, the 1.8 TFSI, the carbon buildup problem is really average for any new generation of TFSI or direct injection engine. View it as a maintenance thing. So every 20 to 30,000 miles, you'll need to get an intake clean done. I had the BG intake clean service done on my car at a local garage and it was as good as new afterwards. The whole process took about an hour I think it was in there for and uh, they sprayed various chemicals and fluids into the intake which went over to the valves, demolished all of the carbon that had built up and left them looking quite shiny and new at the end of it and I felt a big power difference at the end. I hadn't really noticed that the power was starting to dip. So if the car's got some mileage it's not making the power that you would expect or you're starting to get flat spot. Suspect carbon buildup in the head. Certainly use some sort of cleaning process or go to a specialist that can do a walnut blast or the BG intake clean service and just make sure that those intakes and valves are as clean as they can be. So routine care, using good quality oil will minimise the problem that you have with carbon buildup to quite a large degree. Adding additives to the oil and even the fuel can keep the injectors working effectively. So generally, if your engine is burning quite cleanly, you're going to have less of a problem with carbon deposits because there'll be less carbon in the exhaust. The particles will be much smaller, much better burnt, and the catalyst will be able to handle those. So they won't be flowing around inside the engine, clogging up the crankcase vents and everything and might making their way back to the intake. So another problem that I had on mine was the water pump failed. So the water pump is basically a, a mechanical unit, it's connected by a belt to the crank, but it's got a plastic impeller on and the plastic impellers do wear over time. So either the little plastic fins will break off and it'll be less effective at moving water around or the connection between the propeller and the shaft will start to wear. So that propeller will just start to spin freely and it won't be getting as much of a bite and the water will be moving much more slowly. There are aluminium and metal alternatives that you can use that last a lot longer than those plastic ones. But I would certainly recommend, because it's plastic, it's a water pump, it's going to fail. When you get your cam belt changed, it's really no extra effort just to whip the water pump off and to put a new one on. And the cost really is minimal. And certainly compared to the cost of a breakdown and having to get it retro done, where they would have to undo the engine and get all of the, the belts slackened off and take the water pump out. So if you're getting that job done, you may just as well throw in the new water pump and just be done with it. So one other thing to watch out for when you're tuning the EA888 TFSI engines is the overboost problem. So if you've added a big turbo, you're running a lot more boost or you've just had it mapped and the person that did the mapping didn't check all of the components within the engine. You may well find a situation where the ECU is reading far more air than it should do and it doesn't like it. So it goes into overboost mode, it shuts things down, it starts closing down the turbo, the fueling, backing off, effectively putting you into limp home mode. So the engine is protecting itself. It's working safely, but it's detected there is a problem there. It can be a very intermittent problem, so very, very hard to diagnose. But the most common cause of complaint that causes this, apart from a badly done map that doesn't take into account all of the other mods in the engine, is usually the airflow sensor has started to deteriorate, or the airflow sensor is not up to the job of measuring the new amount of air that comes in. So if you typically had, say, a 2.5 bar air sensor on the intake, you may need to increase that to a 3 or a 4 bar air sensor and make sure the map knows what the sensor is and what it can read and that all of the tables have been adjusted accordingly. And that should help you to avoid that overboost problem. There's an article on our website dealing with the overboost error code in a lot more detail. It discusses the causes of this problem, how to avoid it, how to diagnose it. So if you're suffering from that problem after tuning, drop by our site. The links are at the bottom. Just 
make sure that you know everything you need to know about that problem, especially if you're getting flat spots and poor running. So we hope this video has been useful to you. We've got another video on the two litre TFSI, the EA888. We'll include the 1.8 as well because they're very similar engines. We'll be looking at tuning and modifying it, the best upgrades for those engines, just to help you to get as much power as possible from your project. Please drop us a like. It really helps us to get out there. And don't forget to stay tuned. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. Don't miss out on all the other content that we're pushing out. I'm trying to release weekly videos and within the week I'm releasing videos based on niche questions that I've got from my viewers and people from our website. So, so far I've been focusing on Audi. I want to get the main Audi engines and models covered and out there just to keep everyone happy. But I've got lots of requests for BMW, for Seat, for Skoda and Honda, you name it. There's articles and videos coming up. But drop by our website. I've covered pretty much every car, every engine in some form or another on the website. So make sure you drop in and have a little look at the website and just keep up to date with all the options for your car. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.